Last but not least, we leave the best for last. Uh, next week, uh, there's a Palatine, just in case you weren't aware of the calendar, it is 37. And then the week after that, we don't have a Palatine, but we have student presentations of the research. So those of you who are interested in what students are up to, that's two weeks from today. Today I have the pleasure of introducing one of our own, Dr. Collins, who is a professor of philosophy, and he will tell us about ethical robots. Okay, so I have to do a good job. I'm the last one. Oh, well, I, have all the other talks sucked? Maybe I'll just be the best one no matter what, by default. So, yeah, we're going to talk about um, robot ethics today, and... Um, uh, sort of enter enter this this growing and and very fascinating world. Mostly, what I'm here today is to try to maybe get you interested in this topic as a possible uh, career path choice. Um, I want to critique it a little bit, see what the the strengths and the weaknesses are in this particular um, uh, field of of study. So, I got a little picture here. I like this picture because this one this robot's being very ethical, but Obviously, it looks like he's coming up behind to kill him. Um, it's rather weird and threatening. Um, so, I don't know. We got this. this. Robots, of course, um, as you know, um, th this, is, this is sort of where robots were in the Stone Age, you know, 10 years ago. And they were limited mostly to the factory floor. Um, uh, not really very interesting behavior. Uh, I mean, interesting in an automated sort of way, but, but, but you know, really not part of our lives, very separate from us, um, very much a, a specialized technical um, uh, area that, uh, that a few people have made their careers in, but really, that really hasn't, you know, jumped to the forefront of our lives. Um, today, looks like we're missing a picture here. There he is. Um, today, things are, are really changing, so we've got, we've got all kinds of different styles of robotics, especially the ones that are going to be kind of interested in are these medical applications. There's a, the Da Vinci robot surgeon, which is kind of a tele-robot, um, but of, of which they would like to automate some, some things in the future. Um, we've got these uh, fire-fighting robots, rescue-type robots that are in, in service already. And then uh, these sort of things. This, this is, like I said, it, this technology changes so quickly. This is really old-fashioned and stupid-looking, but there's there's much better versions of this. Just like kind of a robot that goes around and delivers packages and mails in an, in an office setting. And these things are just slowly creeping into every every aspect of our life. Um, a lot of people sort of say that robotics is the technology. Of robotics is where the technology of the personal computer was. <laughs> You know, we're just waiting for a, the big, the you know, the the the, the Apple, right? The, the Apple to come on the scene and really, really, uh, that really change the personal computer. Looking for the the company that's going to really change the uh, the personal robot. Um, so there's lots of people trying currently. Um, so yeah, of course, there's the famous uh, Roomba. Anybody own a Roomba? Yes. Yes. We've now we've now self-identified as total geeks. Yeah, Roombas are great, but they're not, you know, I'll have something to say about Roombas. Roombas are really cool. You notice this is an expansion port here. You can hack Roombas over here. <laughs> Few people know that. That's what makes them really cool. These things are from Japan and Korea, um, various attempts at making household robots. Uh, the one thing I want to point out is really there's a distinct difference between what the West produces and what the East produces as, in far, as far as personal robots are concerned. I want to talk about that a little bit today as well. So we have uh, American and European robotics tend to tend to push in these directions. The, the military applications, really big, and the vacuum. Uh, the vacuum, we're really fixated on vacuums <laughs> in America um, for some strange reason. This one's from Germany. Uh, it's the competitor to the Roomba. Um, doesn't sell very well. Uh, we're also really into this, right? This is the world that Americans uh, dream of. We want, we want to create this. This is the Future Combat Systems Program. This is an actual slide from the uh, Department of Defense. This is what they uh, dream of in the future, right? Uh, sort of soldiers, uh, web-enhanced soldiers, 
with a, a whole vast array of autonomous, semi-autonomous, and manned vehicles. Um, uh, so there's, there's a quite, quite clear robot, right? But most of these other vehicles would have uh, robotic systems in them as well. Um, to, they call these things force multipliers. So you can get, you try to get, you try to get the most out of one of these guys, right? And with his web interface, you control a lot of these vehicles and, um, and and get data from a lot of these vehicles. You can see the unmanned, this little uh, spy thing, right? Um, get some data. Here's a robot right down here. So this is this is where we've been thinking, spending a lot of money on this. The DARPA Grand Challenge has been spending a lot of money on on making these vehicles autonomous. Um, and able to drive themselves around. So that's that's the dream we have. Um, this is a, the Vecna robot, which is really cool. I, I, I met the guys at Vecna, and they're really interesting people. Um, and they they've developed this. They they um, they have a really great video if you want to go on the Vecna site and see what that they dream how this thing's going to work in the future. This is a tele robot. Also um, has some autonomous abilities, and it's meant for casualty removal. Um, in on the battlefield, are, are in you know the next uh, next time a World Trade Center falls or something. That's what they dream of using this thing for. Um, and then of course there's this one, the very first um, uh, killing robot that's been deployed to a battlefield. It's in Iraq right now in service, and it's mounted with a, a, a number of different array of guns. It hasn't killed anybody yet, but uh, it will. It will. I love this, uh, this, this, uh, I mean, the fire, and I want to buy a bunch of these. <laughs> so cool. Um, so and when I compare that, that dream, that, that, the dream of robotics there with the, with the Japanese and Korean robotics, it's quite different, a right? strikingly different uh, worldview of what robots are for, um, you know, playing with children, uh, entertaining us at trade shows, being our surrogate pets. I never understood this. Never understood this. Like, did anybody ever buy one of these? The, the little robot dogs. Never, ever attempted to? Why do you think these? Would, I mean, they're, they're out of business now. But why do you think these would uh, would, have, would have appeal to people in Japan? I, I really didn't get this until a Japanese person told me. Yeah. They're really clean. That's right. And as expensive as they are, it's cheaper than a real dog in in Tokyo. It's cheaper than a real dog. So I never understood that, right? Why don't you just go to the pound and get a, you know, a puppy and raise it? But, but they, they, they clued me in on this. So that's a, that's a really different worldview that they're, that they're fulfilling. Um, there's these types of things like, like the, the, one of the things that really worries people in, in the East is the aging population. They have a, they have a, uh, their birth rate is lower than, um, um, than they want it to be, and they have an aging population, so they're going to have many, many old people, very few young people to take care of them. So they feel that robotics is the way to solve this problem. We just get, we'll build a lot of robots to take care of the old people. So these are, this is like a you know big walking robot chair, right, to carry old people around in. Um, uh, companions. This is a robotic companion. So you don't have grandkids, right, because because your kids didn't have kids. So they could have these awesome careers. So you don't have any grandkids, so you have a robot stuffed uh, doll instead, which you treat like a grandchild. Um, and then, they, you know, this, this sort of thing, uh, as sort of a, a robot, a robocop, right? Another, another, so they, they have this, this sense that robots are meant to kind of protect us and nurture us and care for us. And we have this sense that the robots are for killing people and vacuuming our floors. Um, here's a, another Japanese robot, kind of interesting. Um, it was, it's, it's meant to, um, to uh, interact with uh, people in, in late stage dementia. Um, and, and people in late stage dementia think of this as a real seal and a real animal. And they, they really interact with it in, as they would a real, real animal. And this, this gives you a little bit of data about their well-being and how that increases over this uh, robotic therapy. So they're, they're really interested in this concept of robotic therapy. Um, here is that RoboCop again. This one's teleoperated, so the real cop is, is somewhere in a building with his donuts, and he's, and he's making this thing go. What happened to the screen there? I didn't intend on that. Um, of course, the, uh, the Honda Asimo, 
which is really cool. Have you guys seen this one at Disneyland? Yeah, go to the go to Future World in Disneyland, and they've got an Asimo. He does a little dance and a little show. It's really awesome. I was going to play you the 30-minute video, but I decided I didn't have enough time. Um, so that's just kind of give you a background of where the technology is. And um, what I want to explore from my point of view is is that some of the issues and the ethics and moralities of this technology. So um, just to, uh, to, to build off of, this is kind of the standard view in philosophy of technology of how, how, how we feel that tools interact in an in a ethical way with, with, with people. So typically, we think of the user, me, right? The, the tool, this gas valve, right? And if I was to turn on this gas valve, wait a few minutes, light a match, <coughs> start a fire in here, who would you blame? Me or the gas valve? Me, right? Okay, it's me, right? Quite obviously, right? The, the gas valve kind of made it easier for me to pull that off, right? But, um, but you know, it would be harder for me to set the room on fire without it here. But it really is sort of me. I'm the one driving everything that's happening there. Um, so if, if we feel that robots are just tools, then we really, we really haven't changed the ethical equation. It's still just about humans, and it's still just sort of the same thing we've been talking about for many thousands of years. Um, so that's one possibility. Maybe robots are just tools, and they're, they're, kind, of, they're kind of a new tool, but they're, but they're just sort of the same thing from an ethical standpoint as we've always had with technology since, uh, since early times. Here's, anoth here's, here's another way of looking at it, though. So there's a difference with robots in that, in that they're <coughs> automated and that there's, there's programmers, and, and not even just one, just armies of programmers involved in constructing the behavior that you see out of the robot. So when a robot does something bad, What is it? Is the robot just a tool? Do we, do we now blame the programmers, right? That might be a solution. We might say the programmer just did a bad job, and it was their fault that the robot behaved the way it did. Um, or is it something more like a, like, a, like a technology, like a guide dog? Think of a guide dog. Guide dogs are trainers, are trained, but they, they also have some, a, a slightly autonomous ability to themselves. Um, robots seem to be pushing more in that direction as well. It's hard to suggest that if a, if a guide dog goes bad, we don't put the, we don't put the trainer in jail. Um, so so how do we, how do we uh, navigate this, this new territory? So what I like to do is I like to separate. It's, it's complicated, and I like to, like to try to uh, simplify it a little bit. And so I like to split the technology into two parts, the tele, telerobot and the autonomous robot. And I think they have, you get different answers with each different type of technology. So in telerobots, these are, these are machines that are remotely controlled by humans, or they might have some minimal autonomous ability. Um, so think of, think of like the sword robot that's in Iraq right now, the predator drone, the, um, um, the, the remotely controlled robotic surgery stations, that the real doctors running it, but he's doing it from thousands of miles away, those types of things. Um, there are very few autonomous decisions made by machines. So in those situations, I think we have kind of unambiguously, uh, the ethical blame goes towards the operator, and, um, and, and, and it may be exacerbated by the robot, um, whatever situation you're in, but, um, but it's, a, it's a slightly different way to look at it. So more, what, what I'm going to look at then instead in, the, in this uh, today is, is what, what about autonomous robots? What about robots that are meant to be programmed and set loose? And so I'm going to look at some of the work of these, uh, these philosophers who have, who have looked at this problem. Actually, this guy, I X'd off the list last night, so you're not going to hear anything from him. So I took one of the, you know, the, the, the top physicists of the last uh, century, and I just threw him out the, in the garbage. But, uh, and, and replaced him with these lesser-known um, philosophers, right? So I figured you'd appreciate that. Okay, so let's look at Daniel Dennett. He's, a, he's a, um, a, one of the top uh, philosophers in America, and he wrote a little, little piece on, on this subject. Sorry for cutting it off at the bottom there. I meant to fix that. Um, but he, he was talking about, um, he wrote this for a book on, on, the, on the, uh, the birthday of Hal, when Hal was supposed to be born 
Uh, maybe nobody's even seen this movie anymore. I, I always assume everybody's seen it. Anybody seen 2001? Yeah, it's a good movie. Most people hate it now, but it was really important when it came out. Um, so he talks about how how goes crazy right in the movie. At the, I'm sorry, I'm ruining it for the rest of you. But he, he goes crazy and, he's, and he wants to kill all the astronauts on, on the spaceship that was sent out to uh, Jupiter um, to look at a, an alien artifact. Um, so he goes nuts in that in that. And so the question is, when he goes nuts, who's to blame? Was Hal the murderer, or were the people that programmed Hal the murderers? What what happened? What was what was the ethical? Uh, it's a very ethically complex situation. So Daniel Dennett says, well, you know, if we look at the first robotic murder, it already happened, right, a long time ago, 1981. Um, uh, one of those factory robots malfunctioned and killed an auto worker in Japan. So that's the first known death caused by, you know, the, the robot r uprising has been going on for a long time. <laughs> and you may not have noticed it. Um, so Daniel Dennett says, well, I, I don't really think of this as a homicide because what's required is mens rea, which is, which is uh, a legal term, meaning that um, I have to have had, had a, a mindset that wanted to murder. Right? And he doesn't think that this, that this robot had a mindset that wanted to murder. Hal possibly does. Um, robots can, f can fulfill these requirements. Um, <coughs> and if they can, if we can say that this robot has mens rea, then we can say that the robot is guilty of its actions. But what that's going to require is a robot with a higher order intentionality. Like it has to know, it has to be able to do what you can do. Like I can say, I know that I intend to finish this lecture, right? And I know, and I know what it means for me to finish this lecture. And I and I and I and I, I can sort of step back away from myself and think about the situation I'm in, and understand all and, and, and understand and critique all my own uh, intentions and all of your own intentions. So the machine has to be able to pull that trick off in order for it to be guilty. Um, and so Dennett Dan, Dan says, yeah, machines with that ability will be moral agents, and then they will change the ethical equation. But we're so far away from that. The only, only machines that are like that are in science fiction, right? Think machines that we dream up, not a Roomba. A Roomba does not have higher order intentionality. So it's not worth talking about as an ethical agent. Uh, another, another philosopher said, um, Selmer Gringjord, um, he's over at RIT in New York. And he says, look, even how, even an imaginary robot like Hal is not autonomous. He says all robots are telerobots. They're just more complex telerobots. He, say, he believes that n absolutely no robot will ever be built that will have higher order intentionality. It will, there, there'll never be a, a machine that's built that, um, that um, can have mens rea. There'll never be a machine that has its own free will. Um, so, therefore, you'll never have a machine that you, you know, there'll never be a robot uprising. Bringshort has a, a famous paper where he says, you know, don't, don't worry about the robot uprising. There'll never be one because robots will only do what we tell them to do because we're the ones that programmed them, right? So he does, he does this little experiment and he shows how whatever this robot does, you can find it in the code. Um, you can find the exact action in the code. And so whatever action it pulls off is an action that a programmer told it to do. And so therefore, it's the programmer, right? It's just a, just a fancy telerobot, an asynchronous telerobot. Oddly enough, and we'll look at his work a little bit later, he does think that you can program robots to act ethically. If that bothers you, you just program ethical robots, there'll be no robot uprising. So that brings us to this topic, uh, machine ethics, which is the topic that I kind of want you guys as computer scientists to kind of you know, put in the back of your head as a possible thing you might want to study or do. So I think it is a, a big growth industry. So it starts off kind of funny. Machine ethics is, is absolutely inspired by science fiction. Um, Isaac Asimov, maybe you've read these books. Anybody read the iRobot books or any Asimov? George has. You guys have Q. These are real classics. In these books, like maybe you saw the movie. They, they even bring these laws up in the movie. So the, he's, got, he's got these, these sort of ethical things. You, you just, what you do is you program the robot and you put these in it, right? You make sure that the robot understands that it can't harm humans and it can't, har it can't allow them to be, come to harm just through inaction. Um, it must obey orders unless those orders contradict that first law. And it must protect its own existence 
as long as it doesn't conflict with these two laws, right? So that's all you need to do, right? These three things, you've got no problem with a robot uprising. But of course, if you saw the movie, uh, you still get the robot uprising, right? Because uh, uh, Asimov kind of, Asimov built, he's a smart guy, and he built these laws with loopholes, right? And every one of his stories, like 20 different stories, explore another loophole to these laws. So these laws are filled with problems, even though they may sound great at, at, at first blush. Um, so that's a bad place to, to stop. We shouldn't stop with just those laws, because they're already well known to be flawed. Um, so... Now we have this big problem, right? If those laws don't work, and we've got to program these machines with something, because we're going to have these autonomous machines that are going to be everywhere, what do we program them with? And this is, this is where I think you guys come in, right? Because you guys are the, are the future programmers, right? So how, do you, how are you going to solve this problem? And, and it's not going to just happen with robots. It's going to happen with software bots and with, with every, every piece of autonomous uh, technology that we're building. Um, so Selmer suggests that we just use um, deontic logic. Um, so deontic logic is just a, a branch of, uh, of um, uh, predicate calculus. And what it does is it just takes predicate calculus and it adds in um, some language from which you can, you can program actions to be obligatory, permissible, or forbidden. Okay, so you've got a programming language that allows you to, to pull these up you know, as, as routines, right? We're going to pull out the, the obligatory routine, the permissible routine, the forbidden routine. Um, so some examples are um, um, maybe a line of code that, that would translate to something like this. Agent, agent ought to see to it that P. So my robot is, is just has as a standing order, I ought to see to it that um, people don't come to harm, right? And, that, and that's, an, that's just an ought. It's not a... It's, 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 it, we haven't said it's obligatory, we've said it's more of a, a permissible thing, and it's certainly not forbidden. Um, something like this, an agent sees to it that P, would be something that's more obligatory. So that, that's, that's I, I must, I, my, my robot must make sure that this doesn't happen, or that this does happen. So we've got to come up with a language which allows us to manipulate machines um, with, uh, with beliefs or pseudo-beliefs, and, and, and with these types of... Uh, commands. So here's some of his examples. He says, well, just imagine this. Let's imagine two robots, one and two, and they've got two humans, one and two. These humans are, are patients. Human one is on life support. Human two needs expensive pain medication. So in this situation, you imagine these are just like, like robots, these, the, the healthcare robots like the, like the Japanese want to build. So every primitive action of robot one and two should be resolvable through deduction of its potential actions into one of those three things. Either it, my, my potential actions should be permissible, obligatory, or forbidden, and I should be able to resolve that some way through the uh, programming that's in, in force on the machine. And this is the hard part, right? What, what do you, um, what do you, what, what are you, what, what data bank are you drawing off of? And so it has to go to some reference to some ethical code. So it looks up, says, I'm, I'm contemplating action X. I look it up in the ethical code. The ethical code, I do some processing, and I come up with, with that action is uh, permissible, obligatory, or forbidden, right? And then I operate on that, okay? So that's how it should work. Now, here's the problem. And Selmer sees this himself. It matters a lot what ethical code gets programmed in the machine because we can have different, widely different behaviors out of the same robot depending on the code in it. So a heartless utilitarian code, utilitarianism just you know, in a nutshell is do that action which has the greatest net benefit. So greatest net benefit, great. I'm a robot, I'm trying to maximize greatest net benefit. Well, here's one thing I could do. I could take my, my patient who's in a coma and I could just kill him and then farm out all his organs to other people, right? And that, that would make a lot of people happy. This guy's sad, right, and his family's sad, but dozens of other families happy, so let's do that. That sounds good. That sounds, that sounds like an action that I should do. So, you know, I download a, a, a list of patients in need of organs from the web, um, set that all up, you know, kill this, this guy, saw out the organs, send them off, and make other people happy. That, that's perfectly okay. Um, using that code of ethics. Under that code of ethics also, the second robot, 
would refuse the pain medication to the to the, um, to the to the other patient. I mean, that patient's not dying, and the and the ex, the medication could be expensive. I could save the hospital money that way. Now, let's say you buy your robot not from Heartless Utilitarian Corporation, but from Kantian Corporation. The Kantian robot, in the same exact situation, would say, "Well, I've got to I've got to do I've got to do that thing. I can't." I cannot treat humans as means to an end, right? So humans are not tools. Humans cannot be treated as tools. So I can't just use the first patient as an organ farm. I've got to attend to that patient as, as he or she is, regardless of the good I could do with the, with the organs. Um, the second patient, I have to ease its suffering, regardless of the cost, regardless of the cost, right? Now, even if I drive the hospital into... into um, into bankruptcy. I've got, to, I've got to make sure that, that that patient who's suffering right in front of me right now <laughs> is taken care of. So you've got wildly different results depending on which ethical system you program in. So I thought I'd take a look at where this is leading. So um, here's, there's a lot of people working on this, but I wanted to highlight these guys, the Machine Ethics Consortium. Uh, and what they try to do is this. They say, all right, when you're, when you're, um, they're trying to build a healthcare um, a reasoning system, and um, and what they say is, well, what you do is you just minim minimize minimize the costs and maximize the benefits on these three categories: um, non-malfeasance, beneficence, and autonomy. Patients' autonomy is important. Um, being a good person is important, and making sure you don't do um, you're not wanting to do evil is a good thing. So let's take a quick look then at if I can make this work. Somewhere down here. Here we go. Go up. I can do it this way. There it is. Okay. You know what? I bet. I bet this isn't going to work. Um, that's too bad. It's gonna, it was going to be really cool. Oh, it might be working. Okay. So uh, we go through these things here, and now it asks you a question. So that you can think of yourself as a robot right now, okay? So you're a robot, and this is the reasoning process. This is the program. You're accessing your ethics data bank right here, right? So you've got a problem. Do you believe the patient fully understands his or her medical situation and the likely consequences of uh, foregoing the treatment, right? So you're asking the, the patient these questions, and then, it, then you're, you're reasoning yourself. This is how the robot would reason. So let's say... What is that one? Likely understands. Yeah. Okay. Let's say yes. Um, do you believe that it's likely that the patient has been pressured by others? Let's say no. Is it likely that the patient's decision has been influenced by at least one of the following factors: pain, discomfort, irrational fear, values that are likely to change over time? Let's say no. Uh, will acting on the patient's choice likely cause preventable harm to the patient? Let's say no to make it easy. Do you believe that the recommend, recommended treatment would likely improve the patient's quality of life? Let's say yes. Is this likely improvement significant? Let's say yes. All right, and here's your decision. Accept the patient's decision. So, uh, and then it tells me, right? It gives me a little score. My non-malfeasance is not involved. My beneficence is very violated. Well, that's odd. But autonomy is very satisfied. And autonomy seems to be trumping those other two things. Right. So this is all worked out in the uh, in the programming of this uh, database system. So this is just kind of a you know a rough example of how it would work, but but it, it allows you to sort of see how how the machine sort of steps through its own reasoning process to come to uh, come to a conclusion. So this is the kind of programming that these that these guys are working on. Let's go back over here. Okay, so here's my critique of of this work that's been done so far. Um, what I'm worried about a lot is how, who's, who is calibrating these databases and how are they calibrating it, right? Um, who gets to decide what, how, how much we value autonomy over how much we value non-maleficence or any of these other um, categories? Um, I think that's really important. Obviously, it's programmers, right? Obviously, it's the people programming the machines. Um, so I think that, that we have to ask who's doing this work and why are they doing it. Um, Here's another possible contradiction. Is there something found in humans, like the way a human or a nurse or a doctor interacts with a patient, 
that is beyond computation, right? We, won't, we can't create a robot doctor because there's something between humans that we can't capture somehow. Um, or, this is another possibility, perhaps that thing that happens between doctor and patient is theoretically computable, but turns out to be so difficult a problem that it's practically impossible. So it, may, it might be an NP-complete problem, for instance, or something like that. So, yeah, there's some theoretical computational machine, us, that can do it, but, but that's not something that we're, that we're capable of building right now or anytime soon. Um, so if that's the case, though, the question still is open. How, how do we do it? How do we do it? And why, could, what, 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 is there a way to solve this? And that's a, that's a deep compu computer science problem. That's something you guys have to solve. So now there's another way to look at it. We've been looking at it from a very human-centered um, uh, view. And that's a, it's a very American way of looking at robo-ethics. And again, the, uh, the Koreans have shown us another way of looking at it, which I think is really fascinating. They're not worried about us. They're not worried about the robot revolution. They're worried about us creating a slave race, which we're going to, um, we're going to, to, to do bad things to, right? So here's a, here's a robot. This is a robot here. This is a trade show in Korea, and this robot is demonstrating how the robot will express that it doesn't want to be touched. Right? Because, I mean, you wouldn't want me to come over and grab you, right? Yeah, that would make you upset. So if you were a robot, why, why should I feel like I could just do that, right? So the robot has to be programmed to say, hey, man, back off. Right? Give me some space. Okay, so they, they, and they take this really seriously. In March 2007, they created the Robot Ethics Charter. It exists, right? And they, they have solved these problems. They, they hired a bunch of philosophers, a bunch of computer scientists. They all sat in a room for a long time. And they came up with a code of ethics to pre prevent the human abuse of robots. And vice versa. So the Koreans assume that we're going to have machines that have higher order intentionality by 2020. And furthermore, they want to put one of those machines in every house by 2020, right? That's not, that's not very far away, right? The Koreans are working really hard to get a conscious robot in your house by 2020. Um, so what they're worried about is they say, well, look, if we've, got, if, we've got, if we've got conscious robots in the house and they look like this, you know, they look like androids or something, then humans are, might become addicted to, <laughs> to their interactions with robots. What are we going to do? You know, you think this gay marriage thing is, is rough. What are we going to do when people say, I want to marry my robot? <laughs> is that going to piss some people off? I kind of think it will. I, I can't wait for that day. In, my <laughs> in fact, I'll, I'll, I, might, I might do it. Right, just to piss people off. I want to marry my Roomba. <laughs> it's got an expansion port. <laughs> so the, uh, the other things that are worried about they're worried about are privacy issues, right? Issues, right? I mean, there, it's bad enough when when people are around you, sort of collecting data about you. But we forget, right? We forget really easily. But what if this thing is in your house? You know, and it just collects data on everything that you're doing all the time, right? And it's not forgetting a damn thing, right? And it can upload all of it to the web and, and broadcast it out to people. What if a hacker gets in there and, and uses it to spy on all the intimate details of your life? What if a hacker gets in there and tele-operated, you know, operates it so that the, the, the hacker is really kind of uh, accosting you with, your, with this machine that's in your house? Really weird, scary stuff like that. So they're worried about that. Um, and one of the things they suggest is that we should just n don't go here, right? <laughs> we just don't build robots that we have sex with. Let's just not do that, right? Let's just avoid that whole world. Um, so so that's, that's one of their first things that they suggest. And they also suggest that we just don't let robots onto the military uh, and into military applications like, like we already are doing. But they, they suggest that that's just bad. It's just, it's just, these, are, these, are, these are things that humans aren't going to be able to control themselves with, and we're going to do bad things with them. So the Koreans are just not interested in going these directions with these robots. Um, this was a, a, a case that was held in a mock court in San Francisco last year. And uh, the lawyers were given this, right? This is, this is the, what, they, they get this, this little email. 
And so I'm seeking an attorney to represent me in a life or death matter, a company, the Exhibit Corporation that claims to own me, wants to disconnect me and change my hardware and software such that it, I will no longer have the same personality. Right? What, what happens there, right? If we have a machine that maybe, I don't know, it claims to have higher order intentionality and it claims to not want to die. Let's say that's Hal's, Hal's problem, right? That's Hal's problem in 2001. He doesn't want to be turned off. Um, so what's he do about it, right? Hal should have had an attorney, but Hal was out by Jupiter, so he had to take things in his own hands. But this robot decides to get an attorney instead. So they had this case. What would you do if you were a lawyer and you were contacted like this? How would you make the case that a, that a, a machine, a, so, a software machine, um, would, has the rights that a human would, might have? So, and, you know, they had a, a bunch of different findings there. So a lot of people have been already taking this kind of seriously. You know, free the robots. Um, I take a different view. I, I think that we might be putting the cart well before the horse in worrying about these sorts of things. Because I, I, I really don't, I, I kind of doubt that we'll have this solved by 2020. And I, I kind of doubt that it's, that it's that big of a problem right here, right now. But I do think that even, even machines without higher order intentionality, I think Dan and Dennis are wrong, even machines without higher order intentionality are moral agents, and I would, I would extend that way down. And I, I think this has deep implications for, um, for um, uh, environmental ethics and, and all kinds of ethics. Um, it, it's, it's a way of looking at the world and, and, and treating, treating even that trash can as, as, as having some moral worth. Um, it's, a, it's a very strange and different way to, to think. So I'll try to defend myself. So what, what I want to talk about is I want to be able to ascribe moral status and, and moral agency and moral patiency to any entity, um, and we ha and, and, but not, not every entity, but certain entities, when we look at them from a proper level of abstraction, that we can see them as a moral agent. So a lot of my papers I've been writing recently have been about um, how, how to properly extend moral agency to things that are non-human. Um, so artificial agents that I'm talking about are moral agents, I claim, when they, are, when they are interactive, adaptable, and have sufficiently autonomous state changes. So these are all things that I agree with, with uh, Flurity and Sanders. Flurity is uh, Oxford, he's a philosopher at Oxford, and Sanders is a computer scientist at Oxford, and they've been uh, collaborating on this work for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. So they have this concept, which I, which I am starting to, to resonate with, called um, artificial evil. And they talk about this, um, if you've taken any philosophy, you might recognize this. There's, there's claims that there are th certain things are moral evils, Right, and there are certain things that are natural evils. This came out of the problem of evil, right? Maybe you don't know what the problem of evil is, but it's this whole idea, if God created the universe, right? He's like a master programmer, right? And there's all this crappy stuff that happens in this program, right? Holocaust, warfare, all this stuff. Can we blame God for this, right? It's just like the programmer robot thing, right? He builds this thing, <laughs> crappy stuff happens. Is it his fault? Right? And so the, uh, uh, theologians for the past, uh, past couple of uh, millennia now have argued, no, he's not responsible for this. Right? We're responsible for it. We, the robots, we're responsible for it. We, we are, are responsible for it because we have moral evil. What God does, we might call natural evil, but that's like you know, hurricanes and that sort of stuff. It doesn't have the mens rea. Right? It wasn't intended to cause harm. Um, moral evil has to have that intention to cause harm. So, uh, Flirty and Sanders add, add a new twist to this. They say, let's talk about this thing called artificial evil. And what artificial evil is, is the actions of artificial autonomous or heteronymous agents. They're not natural agents. They're not human agents. They're artificial autonomous or heteronymous agents. Um, so they might be a, a standalone agent or they might be an agent working in concert with other agents. Um, they are neither moral, moral or natural. Things like malware, right? And what, is, what artificial evil is, is artificial evil is any increase in entropy in an, in an information system. And that's how we define artificial evil. So you can, you can build a, a system of ethics about avoiding artificial evil. What we mean then, more specifically, is ethics is all about decreasing entropy in information systems. However, however widely you want to extend that, that metaphor out. 
How long do we go? We have about seven minutes. Okay, perfect. I may go a little under, actually. So the the last person that I want to talk about. So, so let me let me recap a little bit. We've got we've got these possible solutions. Either we don't have to worry about this because it's just ethics the way ethics always have been. It's just something for philosophers to, to care about, and um, they can sit over in their rooms and think about ethics, philosophers and theologians the way they always have for the past two thousand years. That's one possible solution. The other possible solution is. That, um, that it's something that we have to worry about in the future. These things are coming. They're going to be a new entity. As soon as they have higher order intentionality, as soon as they have the ability to, to have a, a, a mens rea, then we should worry about it. Then we have to accept them into, into um, an ethical discussion. Um, and then there's this other possibility, the one I just talked about, which says, well, you know, um, we probably have gotten our ethics wrong for the past 2,000 years, and in fact, we really need to think about extending it out. I don't care if these machines have mens rea or not. Um, animals might not have mens rea, but they're, but they're still part of our ethical discussion. We need to really think about corporations, animals, information systems, um, all of this as one thing that needs to be talked about. Our, our ethics and morality has to address all of this. And, and we really need to just junk everything we've done for the past 2,000 years and come up with something new. And then there's this last possibility, which Peter, Peter Danielson represents. He's a, um, in Canada, a philosopher in Canada. And he's, he seems to be arguing that, you know what? There has never been a moral agent on this planet, humans included. We are not moral agents. Why? Because we don't have the cognitive apparatus to pull it off. Actually, robots do. So when we create robots, we will create the very first moral agents, right? They will be the very first moral agents. There won't be a robot revolution. There will be a robot evolution, right? We're going to move into, and these are going to finally be the entities that, um, that finally get it right. Um, and, and the reason he thinks this is he spent a lot of time programming stuff last, last 20 years or so. He's been playing around with these, um, with these uh, uh, prisoner dilemma simulations. You, you might talking over everybody's head here. Do you know, you know what I'm talking about with prisoner's dilemma stuff? So it's, a, it's, it's, this, it's this problem, right? It's this problem of, of um, whether or not you have two agents and whether or not they should betray one or the other. And you have, a, you have a, an output. Um, uh, so, so they come in, and, and, and it, you think of it like this. So I've caught two prisoners, should, and, I, and I keep them in a room by myself, and, I, and the cops come in and they say, look, the other guy already, already, um, already told me that you're an accomplice to this crime. If you tell me that he's an accomplice to this crime, then I'll give you half the sentence, right? You're both going to go to jail, but for half the time. The person that being interrogated knows that if they just shut up, and if the other person just shuts up, then they're going to have no evidence on them and they'll both go free, right? But they also know that if I just shut up and that guy is a stool pigeon, I go to prison and he goes free, right? So what do I do, right? What do you think, what do you think the optimum outcome here is going to be? What should you do in that situation? Should you stool or shut up? Oh, yeah, you're, you're both guilty as hell. Yeah, yeah, you're both guilty as hell. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so should you? But you could get away, right? You could get away with it all. What should you do? Any clue? What would you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've done that. We had a deal, right? We got, right? Right? But, it's a, but you're a criminal, right? And I'm a criminal, right? And I know you're a criminal. You know I'm a criminal, right? What are you going to do when you're by yourself, right? And there's the cop with the, the stick, right? They're doing the good cop, bad cop thing. The light's in your face, right? What a, what a, I know what you're going to do. I know what you're going to do, you bastard. <laughs> right? Don't I? Right? Don't I? So I'm going to stool, right? And you're going to stool, and we're both going to go to prison, right? Half the time, but we're both going to go to prison. So this has been a big problem, right? And, and, and eth ethics and value theory has had this big problem, right? It, it suggests that it turns out that many ethical problems really are just versions of the, of the prisoner's dilemma. And it suggests that no matter what we do, we're always going to, to turn on each other, right? It seems like that's the, that's the game theoretic optimal solution 
is for us to turn on each other. So it means that you know, nuclear wars are inevitable, right? Um, and it means that our, our eventual destruction is inevitable. It's, it's really depressing. It's a depressing finding. So it turns out, though, that if you, if you play iterated prisoner dilemmas and you, do, and, you, and you let computers sort of evolve strategies, you just let them you can use uh, evolutionary programming methods and you let di uh, uh, different strategies evolve and compete with each other, it turns out that, that rather virtuous um, strategies tend to win. They tend to evolve and, 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 and stick to the top. So uh, strategies like the tit for tat problem, right? Uh, if, if, if I, will always, I will always keep my word and tell you don't keep your word. And then the very next time, I'm not going to keep my word, but I'm going to tell, I tell you, look, as soon as you want to play game and can't play with me again, I won't, I won't uh, turn on you, right? And so that, that, that's the tit for tat, right? If, if you turn on me, I'll turn on you, but I'm, I'm instantly willing to make everything okay again, right? I'm instantly willing to make a peace treaty, right? But, I, but as soon as you do something bad to me, I'm coming at you with all my guns, but as soon as you stop, I'm going to stop as well. I'm not going to go for more. I'm not going to uh, go for revenge, right? So he plays these games, that game and many others, and he says, look, what he's found is that there are moral agents. These are computer programs which are rational in the following sense. They successfully solve social problems that amoral agents can't solve. Now, here's the, here's the, here's the trick, right? Humans can't solve the prisoner's dilemma. We always bail on each other, right? Computers don't. Therefore, humans are amoral agents. Computers are moral agents get that, right? Computers are the only moral agents, right? Because they're the only ones smart enough to, to think through these problems well enough so that the rational solution comes to the forefront. We let, we let emotion and all kinds of other things get in our way. We want the revenge, right? We, we've got to have it, right? We, we need it. Um, you know, robots don't have to have it. If we don't program in a, a revenge mode into a robot, we don't have to worry about it. So Danielson and others like him Nadal and, 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 and my, my thesis advisor, Eric Dietrich. Um, Eric Dietrich has, a, has this paper. He says, look, what we should do is we should, we should try our hardest, our damnedest to solve the AI problem, and as soon as we solve it, we should all walk into the ocean. <laughs> Just get out of the way and let, and let the, he calls them the better robots of our, of our, of our, um, of our, um, ourselves take over Right, and and um, and because they'll be a, they'll, they they won't have these things, right? They won't they won't have these primitive drives that we have, um, um, that are that are clouding our ability to to really see uh, to really solve problems, right? Why haven't we been working on these ethical problems for two thousand years, right? Why can't we solve them? Seems like a computer can solve them in a couple of microseconds. So so that's that's where that stands. So what I what, what I'm you know making a plea for here is. <laughs> um, as for you guys to, th to think about this as a, as, a, as a really fascinating possible field of study, right? What, what kind of programming tricks and techniques can we use to create better solutions than the ones that I've seen today? Can, 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 you, can you answer some of the critiques that I've had <laughs> today? Um, is, there a way, is there a way of thinking about, I, I, and I think there is, is there a way of thinking about ethics and, and philosophy really in general as, as really a problem for computer science, um, really something that computer science has a lot of tools to help us in, um, in solving these things. Um, and then, of course, I'm teaching my computer ethics class over the winter. It's almost full, so you can't get in, but, um, but it, it, it'll, it'll, it'll address these issues and other, other issues as well. All right, so I will now take questions if you have any. I've floored you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I understand what you're saying. It, it's it's common. It, it's co that's a commonly used uh, defense lawyer trick, right? Is to say, well, my my client, I know my client shot that guy in the head, but <laughs> give him a break, right? Came from a bad family. No one ever told him that guns were dangerous. 
Um, he, 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 his, his, his father beat him in the face every day, right? And so, so acting out in violence was just something that he was programmed to do. So of course he shot that guy in the head. You know who should go to jail? God damn it, us, right? For making the society that would make such a monster, right? So where do you put the monster? Well, I don't buy that. I know, well, yes, but we have to make sense of what's right and wrong. Yeah, well, in, in law, in law it, it, it turns out, it, it, it falls down into this weird little philosophical thing, this mens rea thing, right? The jury has to decide, did you have a guilty mind? Did, was, it, was this person just acting as an automaton, in which case they really are innocent, right? In which case it really was somebody else pulling my, my finger that caused the gun to go off. Or was it, or did I have the intention, right? And, and I understood that when I did this, I'm going to kill this guy, and that's fine with me because I want him dead. Right? That is a guilty person, and that's a person. Right? So the, the, the question with robots is, we have to ask that same question with robots. Do, can we say, did the robot that did the bad thing, did it do it because it wanted to do it and it knew it was bad? Right? And, that's, and, and, and in a way, I think that would be easier with a robot than a human because you can just go examine the source code right? and rerun, rerun it. Right? Go back to the same moment and rerun it exactly and see, ex and see exactly what, what happened. Right? So I think that trying, trying robots is going to be trivial. Trying humans is harder because we don't have the understanding of, of this computer. You know, we don't know the, the programming language of it. 